information theory is all about the relation between probability and encoding information. And specifically, what it can do for us in this lecture is that it can give us an interpretation of this negative logarithm of a probability that we've been using so far. As an illustrative example, imagine you're on holiday and you've brought your travel monopoly set. Unfortunately, the dice have gone missing. You do, however, have a coin with you. Can you use the flip of a coin to simulate the throw of a six-sided die? To work up to the answer, let's first look at the solution for a four-sided die. In this case, the solution is easy. We flip the coin twice, which leads to four possible outcomes, each with equal probability. And we simply map these four outcomes to the four sides of our four-sided die. So flipping tails twice gives us a one, Flipping tails and then heads gives us a 2. Flipping heads and then tails gives us a 3. And flipping heads twice gives us a 4. For a six-sided die, we need to be a little bit more clever. We'll show the solution for three sides. And then you can just add another coin flip to that to decide whether the outcomes represent 1, 2, and 3, or 4, 5, and 6. The trick here is to do the same thing we did in the last slide, but to assign the fourth outcome to a reset. If you throw two heads in a row, you just start again. Theoretically, you could be coin flipping forever, but the probability of resetting more than five times is already less than one in 1,000. And what this tells us is that in many cases, we can represent a probability distribution by this kind of tree corresponding to flips of coins. For the rest of this lecture, we'll stick with trees where each outcome is represented by only one leaf, and these kinds of resets are not possible. So we'll have to accept that the six-sided die cannot be perfectly modeled with a coin, but we can look at what distributions we can model with a coin in this way if we require each outcome to be represented by one leaf in the tree. Here are two examples on the natural numbers. What we see on the left is an exponentially decaying distribution. Each next number is half as likely as the previous one. On the right, we see a roughly polynomially decaying one. By designing these kinds of trees, we can define different distributions. Now the interesting thing about distributions designed in this way is that they don't just give us a distribution on the outcomes, they also give us a code on the outcomes. If we just replace heads and tails with zero and one respectively, then the path from the root of the tree to the leaf gives us a binary code word that we can associate with that outcome. And we call these kinds of trees prefix-free trees because they assign a prefix-free code to the set of outcomes. The crucial property of this code is that if we want to encode a sequence of these outcomes, we can just stick the codes of the elements in the sequence one after another, and we won't need any delimiters. Any decoder that has access to the tree will know exactly where each code word ends and the next begins, because no code word is the prefix of any of the other code words. And the lengths of these code words are directly related to the probabilities in the probability distribution that the tree represents. Let's call the length of the code that a particular tree assigns to outcome x, L of x, and we see that the probability of x is 1 half times 1 half times 1 half for as many times as we have to flip the coin to get to that outcome. In other words, 1 half to the power of the length of the code, which we can rewrite to 2 to the power of minus the length of the code. So this tells us, given the length of the code, what's the probability? If we want to know the reverse, given the probability, what's the length of the code? We can simply rewrite this expression, taking the binary logarithm on both sides, and we see that the code length in bits is the negative logarithm of the probability. So here we have an interpretation for what the negative logarithm of a probability means. If our probability distribution can be expressed by this kind of tree, then the negative logarithm of one of its probabilities is equal to how many bits we need to express that outcome if we use the code defined by the tree. So now we can ask exactly which probability distributions are captured by these prefix trees. And there's a result 
that tells us that there exists an algorithm which, given a probability distribution, provides a prefix-free code L such that the difference between this negative logarithm of px and the code length provided by the code is never more than 1. And since we are usually talking about outcomes that would take many kilobytes or even megabytes to describe, a minor discrepancy of one bit is not a big deal, and we can hand wave this away. Therefore, if we ignore this minor discrepancy, or if we allow the code length function L to take non-integer values, we may equate codes with probability distributions. For every probability distribution we encounter, there is a prefix-free code, and for every prefix-free code we can think of, we can turn it into a probability distribution. And with this, we can define the concept of information entropy. The entropy of a distribution is the expected code length of an element sampled from that distribution if we encode with a tree corresponding to the distribution. So we encode with the ideal code for p, what then is our expected code length? This function we will call h of p, so this is a function of a probability distribution. And to work out the expected code length, we can simply fill in the definition of the expectation, the sum over all the code lengths weighted by the probability of the outcome. And if we then fill in the definition of the code length, we get this formula. This is the formula for the information entropy of a probability distribution. And the logarithm in this case is the binary logarithm. And this function is very useful for expressing how much uncertainty there is in a probability distribution. Consider, for instance, a distribution on the outcomes A, B, C, and D. If we have a uniform distribution, then the best we can do is to associate each outcome with a two-bit code word. This gives us exactly four code words, each the same length, so that our expected code length is two bits. If our distribution is not uniform, then we know something about the outcomes. We know that A is more likely than B, and B is more likely than C and D. So what we can do is assign A a shorter code, B a medium code, and C and D longer codes, so that our expected code length is less than the distribution on the left. In this case, the best we can do is 1.75 bits which is the entropy of this distribution. In the extreme case, where one outcome has probability 1 and the other outcomes have probability 0, then we can transmit the outcome in 0 bits. If I want to tell you what the outcome from this distribution was, I don't need to tell you anything, because we were already certain what was going to happen. In this way, we can see that the higher the entropy of a distribution, the more uncertainty we have over its outcome. If we have two distributions, we can compute their cross entropy. And this is usually the case when we have one distribution that is the source of our data and one distribution which is our model. Then the cross entropy is the expected code length if we use Q to encode, but the data comes from P. And if we fill in our definitions, the function looks like this. We take the expectation with respect to P of the code length that Q gives us. The cross entropy is minimal when p is equal to q, at which point it is equal to the entropy. From that we can conclude two things. The code corresponding to p provides the best expected code length, and the cross entropy is a good way to quantify the distance between two distributions, because it's minimal when they're the same, and it gets bigger as the two distributions diverge. The cross entropy is a nice measure, but it's not zero when p and q are equal. Instead, it's equal to the entropy of p. To get a measure that is zero when the two are equal, we can just compute the cross entropy and subtract the entropy of P. This is called the kullback leibler divergence. The KL divergence is zero when both of its arguments are equal, essentially when our model Q is perfect. And we will see both the cross entropy and the KL divergence again later in the course. Now one thing that is important to know is that this log loss that we used in the last lecture to define logistic regression can actually be derived from cross-entropy loss. If we take our data as defining some true distribution px and our model as defining a distribution qx which should be as close as possible to px, then we can define a loss function which is simply the cross-entropy between px and qx summed for all instances in our data. 
we have a binary classification problem. So we are talking about distributions over the two outcomes, positive and negative. And we fill in the definition of the cross entropy that looks like this. And if we have a simply labeled data set where the instances are labeled with true classes rather than with class probabilities, then these px's are either 0 or 1. So for the positive instances, only log qx of p remains. And for the negative instances, only log qx of n remains. So the function simplifies to this, which is the log loss function that we already saw for the logistic regression. This is not just a curiosity tying information theory to machine learning, it has practical consequences. It tells us what we should do in the case where the dataset actually provides class probabilities instead of class labels. In that case, we can minimize the cross entropy between the predicted distribution and the one given by the data. It's also important to know, because in many machine learning libraries, log loss is referred to as cross entropy loss. We will finish up with a brief look at the minimum description length principle. This is a general philosophy that can often be helpful in designing machine learning models. The general idea behind the minimum description length principle is that a model that allows us to compress the data is a model that has learned something about the data. The better the compression, the more we've learned. And if we represent the data by storing first the model and then the data given the model, that gives us a really good way to balance our model complexity. The best way to think of MDL is in a sender and receiver framework. We have a sender who is going to see some data and is going to send that data to the receiver. Before observing the data, the sender and receiver are allowed to come up with any scheme they like. But afterwards, the data must be sent using the scheme and in a way that is perfectly decodable by the receiver without further communication. We won't go into the technical details of MDL, but here, is a broad illustration of how MDL can balance over and underfitting in a regression problem. In this case, we can take the instances and their features as fixed. Both the sender and the receiver have access to that part of the data. And the only data that we want to send over the wire is the target labels. Exactly how you encode a continuous value is a technical matter that requires some assumptions. But for now, we can just discretize the range of outputs and assume that we are using a code that means that bigger numbers cost more bits. And the same goes for the parameters of the model. These are also continuous values, but we'll discretize them somehow. And here we only need to assume that using more parameters in your model takes more bits. Once we've chosen a regression model, we can reconstruct the data by sending the model parameters and the residual values. So for instance, if we pick a linear model, we can send our receiver the parameters of that linear model, and then we have to send them all the values of all the residuals indicated here as green lines. Combining these with the model parameter, the receiver can reconstruct the data perfectly. And since the model is a linear function consisting of two numbers, we can expect to spend very few bits on describing the model, but it gives us very large residuals. So we can expect a large amount of bits to be required to express the data given the model. If we allow a little bit more model complexity, we can fit a parabola to the data this requires three parameters, so the amount of bits used to transmit the model grows a little bit, but the residuals get so much smaller that the resulting code length for the whole data is much smaller as a result. If we make our model a 15th order polynomial, we get a slightly tighter fit, so the residuals get even smaller, but not by much. And the price we pay in storing these 16 numbers required to describe our model means that our message length is bigger than it was for the parabola. So in this case, overall, we prefer the model in the middle, according to the minimum description length principle. This is how MDL can help us to find a balance between over and underfitting. There are many correspondences between MDL and Bayesian analysis. And in fact, they are often simply perspectives on the same thing. To give you one example, if we choose the model that maximizes the posterior probability, as shown here in this optimization objective. And we can rewrite this by introducing a negative logarithm to choosing the model that minimizes the negative logarithm of the posterior probability. We break this up into two negative probabilities, one for the prior on the model and one for the probability of the data given the model. And as we've learned in this video, we can interpret the negative logarithm of a probability 
as a code length. So what we're actually minimizing is two code lengths. First, the cost of describing the model. And second, the cost of describing the data if the model is known. So here we see a direct correspondence between Bayes' rule and a simple application of the minimum description length principle. When we talked before about the problem of induction and the no-free-lunch theorem, we noted that some assumption about the source of our data was necessary to make learning possible at all. Some aspect of our problem we need to assume before we start learning. You can think of MDL as encoding a simplicity assumption. We prefer simple solutions over complex ones, and we define a simple solution as one that compresses the data well. The assumption we make about the universe is that it generates compressible data for us. In the next video, we'll return to linear classifiers and we'll build on the idea that we saw in the last lecture that expanding our feature space can make our model more powerful. We'll look at learnable ways of expanding our feature space in the form of neural networks and non-learnable but very powerful ways of expanding our feature space in the form of support vector machines.